The fort you see is Fort Dansberg on the Coromandel coast and we are here to understand the circumstances that led the Danes to reach the shore of India in 1620 CE. I think you will be surprised to know that the Danes too found a short-lived foothold in India and left behind a small legacy of their own. The King of Denmark, Christian IV, was well aware of the profitable trade routes heading to the East Indies and it was only a matter of time when they too wanted to become a part of it. The first impetus for Denmark came in the form of a royal charter commissioned by King Christian IV in 1616 CE. This charter was granted with the aim of establishing companies which would trade with Greenland and Iceland along with the West and the East Indies. The king saw the establishment of various trading companies such as the Danish East India Company as a way forward for Denmark's economic growth. In 1620 CE, the Danes under the leadership of Ove Gid arrived at the Coromandel coast which was then under the Tanjore kingdom. The Danes were received well by the Tanjore king Nayak Ragunath. Eventually, in the same year, a treaty was signed between the King of Tanjore and Danish East India Company. The terms of the treaty allowed the Danes to use the coastal areas of Tanjore for trading alongside the Portuguese who were already established on the coast. The Danes were also given the permission to set up a fortified settlement in Trancubar, which was leased to them in lieu for an annual payment. The fort eventually came to be known as Fort Dansberg and became the official residence come office of the Danish governor as well as a storehouse for trading goods. Dutchman Roland Krebe became the first Danish governor of Trankebar and soon established a string of Danish factories from Malabar to Makassar in Indonesia. The treaty was renewed in 1621 CE and later in 1676 CE by the Marathas. It is interesting to note that unlike some other trading companies of their time, the Danish East India Company was directly under the control of the Danish crown. They were financed by the king and all treaties were always signed under his name. The Danes focused on trading between different ports instead of sending regular cargoes of ivory, spices, handloom textiles and tea to Europe. The Danes were successful in establishing trading routes in southern part of India, right from Tanjore to Masulipatnam from south to north and from Malabar to Makassar in Indonesia from west to east. But they were unsuccessful in Bengal, which remained the prized coastal market in India. In Bengal, they continued to trade on an informal basis since there was no formal agreement with the Mughals and hence the Danish officials were always at the risk of harassment and corruption at the hands of local custom officials. Such dealings eventually forced the Danish merchants away from Bengal but not without repercussions. In 1625 CE, the Danes lost a ship sent Jupiter near the coast of Orissa. Though tensions brewed up between the Danish and the Mughals for years, the immediate cause for the declaration of war against the Mughals came with the sinking of the Danish ship St. Jacobs in 1640 CE. The Danes blamed the provincial government for obstructing help to the sinking ship and seizing both the crew and the cargo. The Danish governor, William Lael, was designated as the new leader of the colony by the company directors. Lael, who succeeded Governor Pesat in 1644 CE, announced through a manifesto of war in 1644 CE that the Danes were well within their rights to announce a formal war against the Mughals. He cited reasons such as the sinking of St. Jupiter in 1625 CE, alleged kidnapping and forceful conversion of a Danish boy, corruption, lack of compensation 
and lack of display of morale on the part of the Mughals who denied justice to the Danes in many such situations. The manifesto received support from the company officials in India who saw the war as a justified one and also a means to finance their presence in India and increase revenue. Though the Danes were no match for the Mughal army on ground, they were a formidable foe at sea. The Danes started attacking private Indian merchants and their ships at sea. They began looting and plundering to such disastrous levels that Indian merchants began avoiding trade in the conflict-prone areas of the sea. The Mughals now tried seeking a truce with the Danes in 1645 CE since Bengal trading routes had suffered huge losses. The Mughals even offered rupees 80,000 as compensation, but this was refused by the Danes. In 1674 CE, interim peace was declared by both the parties when Malik Qasim, the governor of Hooghly, granted the Danes the right to trade without duties in Pipli, where the Danes had established a factory since 1626 CE, and similarly at Balasore, along with the permission to build the city of Frederick Nagore in honor of King Frederick V near Bengal. In 1755 CE, the Danish East India Company sent a representative from its Trankubar office to the Nawab of Bengal. Their intention was to secure a parvana or district jurisdiction, allowing them to write to do their business in Bengal. They obtained the parvana by paying 50,000 rupees in cash to Nawab Aliwardi Khan, along with many gifts, acquiring three bighas of land at Shripur on the riverfront and then another 57 bighas at Akna for the new building of a new factory and port which the Danes would govern from Trankubar. Thus, Sirampur became part of the Danish settlement in India. It was in the field of education that this small place earned its lasting position in Indian history. It was here that the Sirampur College, one of the oldest educational institutions of modern higher education in Asia, was founded in 1818. By now, the first Danish East India Company was dissolved in 1650 CE and later a second one was formed which received its charter in 1670 CE. This too impacted the pace of Danish expansion in India. But hostilities broke out once again in 1682 CE with the wrecking of Christian Sean, a Danish ship near Palasore. But later on, the Danes wanted to re-enter the Bengal trade and worked out a truce. Despite decades of aggression, they were well received. In 1698 CE, Andreas Andr, accompanied by Thomas Smurds, was sent to Bengal with ships, Indian servants, money, wares and Danish people to settle and trade. He was able to conclude peace with the Bengali governor, Muhammad Azumadi, after which both sides renounced their demands for previously seized ships. The Danes also made a gift of rupees 15,000 to the prince and four canons. Furthermore, Andre signed a lease for a piece of land at Gondalapara near French Chandanagar for 30,000 rupees to be paid over 10 years. This became Denmark Nagore, where the Danes established a factory which served as a base for their presence in Bengal. On 1st January 1756, the Nicobar Islands were declared as Danish Norwegi property under the name Frederick Sean. The second Danish East India Company remained in action from 1670 to 1729 CE and later discontinued its working. In 1732 CE, the Asiatic Company was founded under the Royal Charter that gave the company monopoly over the trade in the Indies for a period of 40 years. In 1753, a factory was opened in Calicut so that the Danes could enter directly into the Malabar coast 
paper trade without hindrance from the Dutch, French and the British. But after going bankrupt, the company lost its monopoly and became a crown company in 1772 CE. The charter of the company was renewed and the company's monopoly on their trade with China was extended while trade remained free with the rest of Asia. How did the politics of European wars impact the fate of Danish settlements in India? It is a curious case where the West meets the East. The British Royal Navy attacked the Danish Navy and defeated them in the Battle of Copenhagen in the Napoleonic Wars that lasted from 1801 to 15 CE in Europe. As a result of this, Denmark was forced to cede the island of Helgoland to Britain. The spoils of the war were also sought in India where the British Navy seized seven Danish merchant ships on 28 January 1808 in Hooghly. Ultimately, the Danes were forced to sell the remaining settlements in the Indian mainland by 1845 CE to the British. It is worth mentioning at this point that even before the British had taken over the Danish territories in India by the 1820s, the European merchants along with Indian weavers and artisans were already moving out of Tranquebar, leaving it depopulated and dilapidated. By 1845 CE, all settlements along with Sirampu were given away to the British. By studying the limited stay of the Danes in India, one would think that they left without really making a mark on the long-standing history of the country. But what if I told you that it was because of the Danish Protestant missionaries that India got its first translation of the Bible in Tamil in 1714 CE? Yes, that would be true as would be the revelation that in 1706 CE, the first Protestant church was founded in Tranquebar and in the same year, a printing press also got set up in Tranquebar. Sirampur played a pivotal role in the impact on Protestant missionaries that were set up by the Danish missionaries directly under orders from the Crown. Danish missionaries and their translations of various Indian works helped in shaping the content of future Tamil literacy. It also had a deep impact on the European understanding of Indian cultural studies. But when the Danish trading posts exchanged hands with the British, the Protestant congregations were also taken over by the British Anglican churches.